And I want to thank everybody for taking the time to be here today, especially the examining committee and especially Dr. Myers, who I understand is uh, joining us from his vacation. So the topic today is what shapes family physicians' patterns of care for community patients at end of life. So you've heard from Moira's introduction why I'm interested in this, but, but why is this topic important? Well, we know that the need for community-based end of life care is growing. More Canadians as our population ages are dying every year and a greater proportion of those deaths are occurring in a community, non-hospital setting. Family physicians are and remain the primary providers of community-based end-of-life medical care. Family physicians, as independent professionals, have wide latitude in how they organize their care activities for their patients. And so, differences among family physicians in how they organize these care activities, the, the patterns of care I'm calling them, as the care activities they provide, and how these activities are organized, these differences may have implications as far as access, quality, and costs of care. So what do we know already? We know that most patients would prefer to die at home if possible. Not all family physicians report providing palliative care. Not all family physicians make house calls or have arrangements for after hours on call coverage. But we do know that family physician participation in community end of life care reduces emergency room usage, reduces transitions between care settings and increases the likelihood of achieving a home death. And we know all of these things from Canadian studies. Which brings me to my question, which is, well, how and why do these differences exist? What shapes family physicians' patterns of care for community patients at end of life? And the approach that I'm taking is, is one that this question really requires an open exploratory approach. We know some things, but we don't know enough that allows us to design narrowly focused, closed-ended question, uh, outcome-oriented research. And we need to understand this both at the system level and at the level of the individual uh, family physicians. And so the approach that I chose for this study was one of mixed methods with two studies, the primary study being a qualitative grounded theory study based on in-depth interviews with family physicians, the secondary study being one of a quantitative secondary analysis of family physician survey data. Um, according to one commonly used taxonomy uh, of mixed methods studies, that of Cresswell, he would call this a simultaneous implementation, qualitative dominant in terms of the priority, constructivist perspective, uh, which we'll, I'll talk a little bit about later, with integration at the level of interpretation. In other words, these were not designed to have the exact same research questions. Uh, but the integration of, of the two halves of the study really occurred at the level of interpretation. So I'm going to talk about each of these studies, starting with this one, What Shapes Family Physicians' Patterns of Care for Community Patients at End of Life? A Grounded Theory Study. The specific research questions for this study were, first, how do patterns of care for community patients at end of life differ among family physicians? H how do family physicians differ among the way that they organize these things? and what shapes the development of these di differences. This was a constructivist grounded theory study, so within grounded theory the particular constructivist perspective was the one that was adopted for this project. It, the primary data was in-depth interviews with family physicians in London, Ontario and region. Family physician participants were recruited via mail and telephone with initial sampling by maximum variation, meaning looking at family physicians of all different types, with ongoing sampling by theoretical sampling, which is the grounded theory practice of sampling ideas to try and round out the uh, findings of the grounded theory study until saturation of the central category, the main theme, the central idea was achieved after nine interviews. Analysis and theory building were by constant comparative uh, methods together with uh, the co-investigator, one of my supervisors. So findings. For the first question, patterns of activity for community patients at end of life differ among family physicians in three dimensions that were described by the participants. So the first was the dimension of locations of activities. This is where family physicians make themselves available 
to provide care activities for community patients at end of life. Hof office, home, long-term care, hospital, family physicians differ in that. The second is timing of activities. When do they make themselves available for care activities? During the day, after hours, weekends, do they have structured mechanisms for ensuring flexibility in the day to, uh, to deal with urgent requests? So timing of activities was another of the dimensions where there was variation. And the third was purpose of activities, or available for what? Let me give you three quotes that illustrate sort of what I mean by differences in purpose of activities. One family physician described their role, the purpose of their activities, as this. They, home care, put in a plan of action for everything and I sign it. Another family physician said, I can moisten their lips. I can make sure that their eyes are lubricated, kind of like the nursing little bits. A third family physician said, many people have no pastoral care and I've had dying patients ask me about God. How can you be that involved in people's lives and not expect it? So while all these family physicians would in a sense have the same goal of helping their patients, you can see that these three statements represent three really different ways of thinking about exactly how what they're doing is going to help their patients and exactly what they see the purpose of their activities as being. When we think about these three different dimensions together, it's almost as if each family physician has their own unique pattern that is their sort of signature way of looking after patients in their practice who are approaching end of life. So when I present it this way, it's not meant to imply that this can actually be quantified in any kind of graphical or numerical form, but for each physician, for example, this particular physician uh, looked after patients in his office and would occasionally make a home visit, so it didn't have as broad a range of locations of availability as some other uh, physicians who participated. Their descriptions of the purposes of that, their activities was really focused a lot around symptom management and provision of medications for that. They didn't describe a whole lot of roles or purposes beyond basic symptom management, but they were highly flexible in terms of their availability for timing. This particular physician, uh, whenever they had a patient who was approaching end of life, would give out their cell phone number to patients and their families and say, call me anytime. So they had a great degree of flexibility in the timing. And so each participant could have uh, something like this that sort of illustrates how the, there's, they have a unique mix of these three different dimensions of availability. So then what is it that shapes the development of these differences? Here's what the family physicians described to me. Their care activities for community patients at end of life, that triangle in a sense where they're, these are the things that they're doing to look after these folks. These activities exist within contexts, and they described two important and overlapping contexts, which I'll talk about a little bit more. And, and there was, in a sense, a dynamic tension and negotiation where they would weigh the impact of potential changes in their care activities for patients at end of life. And the overall theme was one of making it fit. So this summarizes the the grounded theory that arose from this study. Let me talk about the key elements of it in a little bit more detail. So the first is this idea of contexts. The physician context and the healthcare context. Contexts are the activities and conditions with which care of community patients at end of life must fit. So the physician's practice activity was a key context. It fits in with everything else that happens. The physician context, that is who they are in their life outside of medicine, was also consistently described as an important context. It fits my personality. The healthcare context was what happened in the broader practice and, and in the healthcare system outside the practice. One physician described this, I know that this specialist palliative care program evolved because family docs weren't doing it, but now it's excluding the docs who do want to do it. So an illustration of the importance of the broader healthcare context. But these care activities for community patients at end of life were not um, merely shaped and determined exclusively by these contexts. F 
family physicians made choices about how they would organize things within the reality of these contexts. And it was a bit of a dynamic interactive practice uh, that's illustrated by these arrows. And, and I've summarized it as weighing the impact. And this represents the process by which family physicians assess the implications of adjustments in their patterns of activities. What would the implications be for myself and all of these contexts? One physician described this way, we try to make a point of seeing them regularly but not impose on them too much. Negotiating that pattern of activity to fit the patient and family's needs. If it really did impact my family life, I would have to give up that aspect of my practice. So looking at the physician context. Another said, if I had four simultaneously dying, that would be a big time commitment. Not only for my family, but even for the office, because that's booking time off my day sheets, looking at the rest of their practice in the healthcare context. So making it fit, which was the key theme that came through all of these interviews about uh, what shapes the development of these differences, Making it fit is really about this process of establishing patterns of activities and the adequacy with which these patterns enable the physicians to meet the demands of their physician and healthcare contexts. The limitations of a study like this really boil down to the limitations of the participants' perspectives. So the participants in this study were all southwestern Ontario family physicians, none of whom reported not providing care for community patients at end of life. And the, the particular limitations and blind spots that come from my own perspective as a, a researcher who uh, has, has ideas about how I think things should be arranged. Um, and so while there were things that we would do to uh, try and, and uh, mitigate the negative impact that uh, the limitations of my perspective could have, uh, that's a reality that needs to be taken into account. Study number two, this was the quantitative study, Family Physicians' Availability to Care for Community Patients at End of Life, based on secondary analysis of family physician survey data. The research questions for this particular study were, to what extent do family physician respondents to a 2004 regional physician survey report providing access to specific medical services related to the care of community patients at end of life? Specifically, what uh, did they report in terms of provision of palliative care, provision of house calls, and the availability to see patients after hours? And then secondly, what factors are associated with these family physicians' potential availability to care for community patients at end of life? Methods, so this was a secondary analysis of data from this 2004 cross-sectional postal survey of all family physicians in London, Ontario and adjacent counties. Uh, there were 1,044 surveys sent out to family docs, of which 731 were returned. The specific sample that was used for this secondary analysis were comprehensive FPs, so family physicians who described themselves as comprehensive family physicians who had complete responses on all of the variables used for this study, of which there were 482. The independent variables that we looked at, there were seven physician characteristics and seven practice characteristics, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, the dependent variable was potential, avail potential availability to care for community patients at end of life, uh, a composite dependent variable which I'll describe in a minute. The analysis was uh, bivariable analysis of all of the 14 independent variables using non-parametric techniques, uh, followed by a multivariable analysis of the significant independent variables using multinomial logit regression moderate availability was the reference category. We'll talk about that again in a minute. So, so when in these three separate questions that were, uh, that were on this survey, 76% of the comprehensive family physician respondents reported that they did provide palliative care. 70% said that they offered house calls. 30% said that they were available to see patients after hours. From a patient's point of view, the question really is, as I'm approaching the end of life, how confident am I that my family physician is going to be available to meet my needs where I am when they arise? And, and in a sense, if, if 
your, if my family physician answered yes to all these questions, then I'm going to be quite confident that my family physician is likely to be available to meet my needs when they arise. If they said no to all three of these questions, then I'm going to have very little confidence that my family physician is going to be available to address my needs. And if they said yes to one or two, well, there, there might be a chance that they might be able to help, but there, I'm going to have less confidence in that. And so, in a sense, it was, it was that, um, that idea of the patient perspective that led to this mapping of um, these availability categories to the high, moderate, and low availability, with high potential availability being yes to all three, low potential availability being no to all three, and moderate being uh, yes to one or two. When we look at it that way, we see that 22.2% of the comprehensive family physician respondents said yes to all three of those questions. 13.5% said no, they didn't provide any of those services. And 64.3% said yes to one or two of those. These were the 14 independent variables that we, uh, that we looked at. So physician characteristics, age, gender, years in practice, whether or not they had completed a family medicine residency, whether or not they had additional palliative care training, uh, whether or not they were an international medical graduate, and what they described as their attitude toward palliative care at home. So, so this was an attitude-based question on the survey which asked them to endorse the importance of family physician participation in palliative care at home. Practice characteristics, rural urban, group versus solo, alternate funding uh, of some kind versus fee-for-service, whether or not it was a teaching practice, how many patients per week they typically saw, whether or not they had at least one free weekday clinical session, so an idea about is there some flexibility built in during the week to be able to address some of these things, maybe do home visits, and do they routinely have uh, one after-hours clinical session? Do they usually do an evening clinic or weekend clinic of some kind? So when we looked at those, we initially did the bivariable analysis and then the ones that were significant were uh, put into this multivariable analysis using the multinomial logit. There were two comparisons in that. One was comparing the low availability physicians to the moderate availability physicians and that's what we're showing here. Those physicians who were in the low potential availability category were less likely to be funded through an alternative funding plan placed less value on family physician participation in palliative care at home, were less likely to be male, less likely to be in a rural practice, and less likely to be in a teaching practice. So all of these have odds ratios which are significantly less than one, meaning that the low potential availability uh, family physicians were less likely to have each of these characteristics. The uh, analogous uh, analysis was done between the high potential availability of family physicians, these are the ones who said yes to all three of those questions, and the moderate availability category. Those in the high potential availability category were more likely to be funded by an AFP, more highly valued family physician participation in palliative care at home. They were also more likely to have at least one regularly scheduled after hours clinical session and less likely to be in a rural practice. So if we put, if we put those together, what, what's, the, what's the summary of those results? Well, what we see is that remuneration mechanism and attitude toward family physician participation in palliative care at home are both significant predictors of potential availability at both the low moderate and the high moderate comparisons. And we also see that family physicians from urban practices tend to be clustered in the moderate potential availability category. In other words, they were less likely to be low availability and they were also less likely to be in the high availability category. Limitations of this study. This is a study of association, um, so we don't know, we don't know what, whether there's any causative links between these uh, factors that we have found. Again, geographical limitations. This is taken from the same area, London and region. What are, what are the implications for uh, other regions? We don't know. 
This data is nine years old now, uh, and so age of data becomes a question. How would things today compare to what things were like then? And, and I think it's also important that we keep in mind that what we were looking at in this study was potential availability. So, so what I mean by that is um, we took these three separate questions on the survey, one about do you provide palliative care, are you available after hours, and uh, do you do house calls that were, th that were in three separate sections of the survey and were not necessarily linked to one another in the respondents' minds, and I'm interpreting them together. Uh, so, for example, this would not have captured that family physician who I talked about earlier who gives out their cell phone number to all of their palliative care patients, right? That, that, th that practice of, well, I don't normally do after hours visit, but I give out my cell phone number to my palliative care patients, that wouldn't have been captured in this. So there's probably some difference between the potential availability described here and what these family physicians' actual availability might be. So putting these together, um, when we look at the conclusions overall, we see that family physicians vary in the location, timing, and purpose of their activities to care for community patients at end of life. And that family physicians' patterns of activity have to fit. They must fit, and they're made to fit their practice physician and healthcare context. Remuneration by AFP and attitude toward family physician participation in home palliative care are strongly associated with potential availability. These are really the strongest key findings from uh, these studies. What does this mean? What are the implications? Well, it shows that there is no clear standard of care. Variation among family physicians is the norm in how they look after this group within their practice. And so the system, uh, broadly speaking, needs to be flexible enough to accommodate this variety of family physician practice patterns. I think uh, the, the idea of different purposes of family physician care is one that may turn out to be particularly relevant. There's quite a bit of literature about the challenges of coordinating care from a multidisciplinary interprofessional perspective in the care of this patient population. Could it be that some of these challenges to care coordination arise from the fact that there are actually different concepts about the family physicians, what their purpose is, and what the goals, the specific goals of their activities are? Where do we need to go with this? Well, a few different directions, I think. One is that we need to define in measurable terms what it means for family physicians to provide access to a palliative approach for their community patients at end of life. Palliative care is one of those terms that can mean different things to different people, depending on the context that, you're, uh, that we're using it. So, so what does it actually mean for family physicians to provide access to a palliative approach for their community patients at end of life? What are the expectations? How do we define that? How do we demonstrate it? How do we measure it? How do we describe it in a way that lets us figure out how the different pieces of the care system puzzle are going to fit together to meet the needs of this patient population? Um, if we're going to rely on self-report, we need to define our terms clearly, uh, asking do you do palliative care? Um, isn't going to be very good unless we clearly define what we mean by palliative care because it is a term that can be used in so many different ways. And we need to impact the, we need to understand the impact of these variations on family physician practice patterns uh, on patient level outcomes. So to what degree do these things make a difference as far as patient outcomes go? So we know a little bit that family physicians willingness to make home visits as it makes a difference as far as their ability to uh, maintain um, life at home and be able to die at home consistent with their wishes. But do, do after-hours call arrangements have an impact on that? Does the family physician's concept of the purposes of their activities have an impact on that? We need to look at these things to see what the actual patient level impact is. Just before I finish and uh, invite questions and comments from the audience, I want to be sure to uh, make some acknowledgments. First, I want to uh, acknowledge Dr. Stewart and Thind, who are my supervisors and gave lots of valuable input 
uh, and encouragement and wisdom throughout this process. I want to thank the family physician participants who participated in the qualitative study and gave of their time for that. The Department of Family Medicine Research Trust Fund who supported the qualitative component of this study and the survey team who initially uh, undertook the 2004 Changing Face of Family Medicine survey, which was the survey from which I drew the uh, data for the secondary analysis, uh, I want to thank them too. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions and comments.